Before leprechauns, parades, green beer, and four-leaf clovers, there was a faithful Christian leader who ushered in a second era of church planting that wouldn't be seen again for centuries. Today on the Church Revitalization Podcast, you'll learn about the real St. Patrick and why his story is more relevant than ever. Hello, and welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast, brought to you by the Malfurs Group team, where each week we tackle important, actionable topics to help churches thrive. And now, here's your hosts, Scott Ball and AJ Matthew. All right, welcome back to the podcast. It's episode 81 this week, and I'm AJ, and over there is Scott, which I always say that, assuming people are watching, but when they're listening, they're like, over where? Over Let's where? Figure. Maybe we should do like a stereo separation. We'll do mono in each speaker. <laughs> <laughs> like in... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, cool. no, let's not do that people listening in with only one headphone in will be like why'd the audio cut all of a sudden? <laughs> i can only hear that one guy uh so man this is a this is a really cool topic um scott and timely happy saint patrick's day everybody uh yeah. i have to i'm sorry i didn't prep you for this scott i got to give a shout out to the lovely mrs matthew because Today is the anniversary of our engagement. We got engaged on St. Patrick's Day. So I'm impressed that you remember. I guess it helps if it was on a holiday. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> I was going to say, I don't remember the date that yeah. my wife and I got engaged. I really, I've got plus I remember minus, it happening. Yeah. If it was yesterday or tomorrow, then I would still be like, it was the day before St. Patrick's Day. Uh, so, yeah. you know, I think guys, we get like a three day window around a holiday in which to remember maybe something else, but uh, that's a good point. Yeah. I nailed it. It was on St. Patrick's day. And so happy anniversary, babe, love you and on with the show. So, okay. Um, so the story of St. Patrick is really cool. And, and yeah. I love this setup also because next week, uh, next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about some creative individual evangelism and uh wow what a great leader in the church to talk about saint patrick this week scott because that's exactly what he was all about um yeah. so uh yeah kind of give us a little bit more setup on on what saint patrick did so that we can uh, if people are like me and maybe they're not saint patrick historians like you are scott um <laughs> then maybe they don't really know the story they're thinking What's this have to do with snake? What does this about even snake matter? handling yeah. or what? No, right. yeah, definitely that. Also, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, this isn't. I mean, I think this is a really fascinating story, and I should preface all this by saying I'm not actually a, a Patrick historian. So let's because just on the off chance someone actually is, <laughs> and I get part of this story wrong, I don't want to get the hate emails being like, "You got this, you got this wrong." That's not exactly how this happened. Um, I am a I'm an armchair expert on um, uh, on Saint Patrick, and was really turned on to um, his story actually by in seminary. I was uh, for those of you who are watching, you can see the cover. This is a book. For those listening to the audio, I'm showing the cover of a book by George G. Hunter called "The Celtic Way." of evangelism not celtic by the way <laughs> that's the basketball team uh but the celtic way the celtic way of evangelism highly recommend it's only about 140 pages long but really but by the time you get to the notes it's only 121 pages so um worth worth a read um at any rate i was i was assigned it in seminary in a church planting class actually and and totally I've been a fan ever since. Have any a man deserved the title saint? It's definitely Patrick. So let me give you the Cliff Notes version of his story. I don't want to take up the whole podcast by telling his story. You can look it up. Um, admittedly, a lot of his stories pieced together, um, but he did leave. He did leave sort of a record of his life, um, an autobiography of sorts. But he lived fifteen hundred years ago, and so you got to take everything that's that old with just a little bit of grain of salt. Essentially, though, his story is this. He was kidnapped by pirates um, as, a, as a very young man, as a child, really, uh, taken to Ireland, um, where he worked as a slave for many years, um, eventually stowed away upon a ship and made his way back to uh, England, where he was from, and uh, grew up and became a monk um, against sort of the wishes of his family, which would have preferred him to do something what 
they would have felt was more productive to society. Um, but he he becomes a monk. Now, the religious situation, AJ, at the time was such that the the Roman Empire had just collapsed recently. Uh within the you know within the last hundred or so years, right? So um there was not a framework for building new churches apart from conquest. The idea was the Roman Empire comes somewhere, they conquer a place, uh, and then they build a church there. And then everyone who lived outside, even within the territories that Rome occupied, say a place like Gaul, modern day France, um, if you weren't living in a in a city, you were living outside the city in a place where there wasn't a church. The the th the thought process that was that those folks were barbarians, and didn't have the ability to become Christian. Like they, it was outside of their uh, capacity. They were almost like animals. They they couldn't become Christians. And so, this is sort of the the race context, the ethnic context, the religious context that Patrick grows up in. Well, the he Romans knows didn't necessarily learn a lot from Paul, the apostle. They kind of liked the end result, but not his methodologies. So that's right. Yeah. So yeah. they're building kind of, I mean, <laughs> the, the church was more marked by Constantine at this point than Paul. Yeah. Right. Um, or even, you know, more, more by Constantine than Augustine, you know, at, at, at this point in history. Right. So um, it's within this framework that, that Patrick, has this vision then as an adult to go back to Ireland to bring the gospel there. And there's simply, it's, it's, it's difficult to overstate AJ, just how revolutionary this idea was. Mm. There was no mechanism for, for a mission to be sent to Ireland because there was no, there was no empire to go conquer Ireland to build churches there. Mm -hmm. It didn't exist anymore. It was deep, more decentralized than that. And, and it was in the middle of this upheaval of um, turning it into the Holy Roman Empire with wh where power was centralized with the church. But this had not happened really yet. So at any rate, all that to say, um, Patrick has this vision to go back. And he eventually, this is where the story is a little bit muddy. People aren't quite sure the channels through which he had to go through in order to get this approved. But eventually the, um, the church says, okay, Patrick, you can go to, you can go to Ireland, but whatever you're going to do over there, <clears throat> you're on your own, like self-funded. You have, you have our permission only, but you have nothing else, no resources from us, no support from us, just, just approval. So he, he takes it on the chin and says, fine. So he, he liquidates his entire family's assets, everything that he had been left with. Um, and as a man, he's in, in his 40s at this point. Um, and he goes and um, he creates this system, essentially, of church planting, which was go to a place along the river, build a mill, which could be used by the community, uh, by the folks who live nearby, the, the local Celtic people, and without any, no strings attached, just come use the mill. Then he would, then he would build a church second and sort of build the community around that. Um, and people became engaged with that mill community. Um, and uh, people became believers, and then he would train them up on how to, what he was doing. Uh, and then they would get on a little boat. And you can actually Google these. It's like, what these rafts looked like, but they were small little rafts. They almost look like inner tube size type things. They, they, they just hop on, go down the river a ways, Float far enough river. down the river that um, they'd go tubing basically. Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, they go down the river a little bit of ways um, with some resources and supplies that they needed. And they would do the whole thing again, build another mill um, that let people use it, then build a chapel, reproduce the leaders, go down the river and a ways again, and do the thing again and again and again. And, and over the important course of component, time, start upstream. That's yeah. <laughs> Don't make this hard. Much on yourself. harder. Yeah, if you get it. Yeah. yeah. So within one generation, AJ, within one generation, the entire nation of Ireland 
is predominantly Christian. It's amazing. It's a it's amazing. And um, now P- uh, Patrick does not live to see this completed, but the team that he initially started with, he started with some younger leaders. There's another lesson in there. Um, he started with some younger leaders. Some of those original folks would have lived long enough to see this thing happen. And it's truly unprecedented. I mean, just totally unprecedented. Um, and so Patrick is the first church planter in the post apostolic time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Certainly, if we're thinking of church planting the way that we think of church planting now, evangelistically based. And and we really wouldn't see this happen again, AJ, for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Um, There's not really a church planting movement, again, at least in the West. I can't speak for, I don't know what God was doing in Africa and in Asia and other places where the gospel was spreading. But at least in terms of Western Christianity, there, there wasn't another church planting movement like this. Uh, until more modern times. So um, I don't, that was not necessarily quick, but that's, that's the story. And I um, wanted to give you that context so that I could give you three evangelism lessons from Patrick's story that will help your church reach a post-Christian world. So all of that, AJ, was introduction. We needed to get the story in there so that we could hit these three evangelism lessons um, to reach a post-Christian world. Yeah. And, you know, there's certainly a lot of connections to be made for today in, in the way churches Mm -hmm. feel about where they are and what their Mm -hmm. abilities are. And that's another part of the point that we're trying to make this week and the setup for, you know, a couple of, um, of upcoming episodes as well, because over COVID, especially we've just seen so many churches that thought everything is stacked against us. There's nothing new under the sun. We can't do anything different. We're not allowed to meet together. We're not allowed to go places. We can't do anything. And a lot of churches have just punched the pause button on evangelism and outreach. And um, and so that's part of what we're doing here today and the next couple of weeks is saying, you know what, let's think outside the box. There are yeah. some creative things that we can do to continue to bring the gospel to people that need to hear it. And uh, And yeah. today is just a great kickoff for that. Well, and what you just said is a great segue to to point number one. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, number one is you've got to take some risks. Um, there's and and that so that's stepping outside. You know, I mean, there there's no such thing as a risk within a comfort or doing the same thing again. Um, risk by nature is something different. It's something unknown. Um, and it's something that you know you you might have to work a little bit at gathering support for. So, uh, yeah, we'll take it from there, Scott. Um, we've got several yeah. components of risk to consider. Well, on, on, on the first thing that you were saying earlier, AJ, so many churches, I think, are discouraged because the world seems to have changed so rapidly. And mm-hmm. I don't know that the change has necessarily been rapid. You know, c- culture has been shifting for a long time, uh, certainly for, I would say, at least since the sixties, right? You, you've, you've had, you know, this big cultural revolution in the 1960s mm-hmm. and, but, but back then it was still mainstream and accepted for, to be Christian. And in fact, there was some social pressure to, to be Christian and everything that we were doing in, in church was oriented towards that cultural reality yeah. that, yeah. that Christian, Christian thinking and what was the predominant, you know, cultural norm. And I think we have crossed whatever threshold there was previously. Mm. Um, it's, this does feel, it feels so accelerated, but whatever the midway point is to feeling like the drivers of culture are post-Christian, we've crossed that tipping point. Yeah. Uh, It's still not a, the majority of Americans still identify as Christian AJ. So that's, that's a reality too. But when it comes to the cultural drivers, what you see on television, what's 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 driving social media, all that, it's mm-hmm. it's increasingly antagonistic towards Christianity. Yeah. Um, and so it it's best not to try to fight to preserve the past, but reorient it from defensiveness towards being um, not offensive, but on the offense, right? Yeah. 
-hmm. You want to take a more uh, offense oriented approach versus a defense oriented approach. The church for a long, long time. I mean, think about AJ, sort of the nineties and the focus on the family. And I got nothing against those guys, but every, everything that we've built in, over the last couple decades has been on the defense. Has it not protecting family, protecting culture from yeah. this? We are past that now. Now you're Patrick. Now you're looking at, we have this world that, that everyone tells us is unreachable, this mm -hmm. post-Christian world that's antagon antagonistic towards Christianity. The only way that you're going to reach this culture, AJ, is if you take a risk. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I, sorry, I didn't mean to get stuck there. So, put simply, you have to accept the reality that what worked before doesn't work anymore. Just attractional church Christianity. I mean, you even think what what the Bill Hybels and Rick Warrens of the world did in the 90s in terms of purpose-driven type stuff, Willow Creek type stuff, um, attractional church. It's not, it doesn't work anymore. The if you build it, they will come thing doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't really matter how cool your worship service is. Mm -hmm. Because most well, people are going to... As a bit of an aside, I don't want us to, to get totally sidetracked, but a lot of churches have taken that maybe beyond... Um, a healthy place and become so <laughs> much like the world to be attractional to the world that it's kind of hard to tell the difference between them and the world at this point too. That was, actually, that was just brought up. My pastor brought that up this last Sunday that um, that's, that's a danger zone that unfortunately some churches have begun to step into at least dip their toe into. And that's not what we're talking about. Um, that's, you know, no, you know, and that's a good point. You could you even take it on the other extreme and go, well, then there's no point in changing what we're doing since, since the attractional church stuff doesn't work anyway anymore. Why get a, why not just stay stodgy yeah. <laughs> and do things we've been doing. I mean, that's not the takeaway either. Right. The, uh, you hopefully you are, doing your services in a way that engages socially or uh, spiritually disconnected people. Mm -hmm. But that alone is not what will, it is not what it will take to reach a post-Christian world. That that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so you got to accept that reality. You need to spend money. If you want to reach people, you're going to have to not sit on whatever that nest deck is. I've said it before, probably on this podcast, I've certainly said it to churches, but your church was not designed to save for retirement. <laughs> right? Yeah. It, uh, it's world without end. Amen, amen. Like this, the church is not going anywhere until Jesus comes back. So your church doesn't need to be saving, save for a rainy day, not for retirement. And yeah. so if you've got right. something beyond the rainy day fund and you're saving for retirement, you're going to need to spend it. Yeah. Not saying spend indiscriminately i'm just saying don't don't be a miser when it comes to evangelism um and finally to, before we move on to point two i just want to say not everyone's going to be on board uh i was talking with a, a church recently that's navigating this and they said well what do we do you know we've got a, some folks who are not really on board with making changes actually two churches in the last couple of weeks that both said this almost word for word we know we need to change in order to reach the next generation but we have some people and they help financially support the church and they're not on board with these changes how do we keep them happy essentially mm. um while still pursuing these changes and and i said you got to be willing to not let them be happy I went over as many as you can, but you can't stop moving forward for their sake. Yeah. It's not, that doesn't work. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. If you put funding the status quo over chasing the vision, where, where are you left with? You know, what, what's the future look like if that is the decision that's made and it may not be a conscious decision, but you got to pull back kind of, you know, evaluate your situation. And if that's what you're doing, then you're not really, you're not funding the future, you're funding the past. Mm -hmm. And that comes to an end. I've said this before, I think on the podcast where we have AJ, I don't remember which episode, but there's, there's loss in not changing and there's loss in changing. Mm -hmm. That's true. 
Um, but there's on the only upside is with change. There's no upside in the status quo. Eventually you'll lose because people don't live forever on, on this side of, of eternity. So mm -hmm. those folks who, who you're, you're keeping happy, they'll go, they'll either leave or they'll, they'll die and you'll have no church. There's no upside. You may lose some money when you're pursuing uh, evangelism and making some changes to reach your community. Uh, that's true. You, you may lose money uh, in the short term. You may lose people in the short term, but there's an upside. Uh, you'll also reach your community. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but there's, there's loss on both ends, but only one, but only one has an upside. So yeah. Um, real quick example of this uh, church that um, I worked with just last week. Um, I, shout out to Capstone Church. They're doing such a great job. Um, they're not a mega church by, by anyone's standards, but they are doing the, some of the most innovative work I've seen. Uh, you walk into their church and it would look like any other church. It's all the things you don't see that they're doing. Um, and that is really making it work. They've got, um, uh, their pastor serves on the, in the city, um, on some key boards and has, has a voice in that. Um, another one of their staff members, <clears throat> um, their family runs a, a hardware store um, in the community. And so they're really connected that way. Another staff member used to run the Parks and Rec Department years ago and is still really connected to the community that way. I actually rode in his truck with him. And literally everywhere we went in this town, people saw him and were waving at him because um, they're just that ingrained in the community. And um, they're doing some really innovative stuff in their church as well, in terms of they created this nonprofit to reach some of the local kids who live in government projects uh, throughout the week. Just really, really, really good stuff that they're doing. Um, and so shout out to Capstone Church. You're doing a great job. Um, and they get it. And they've lost people. They lost people, AJ. There have been people along the way who were like, this is too hard. I just wanted some place to come on Sunday and sit. Yeah. And um, the pastor there told me, he's, he says, I tell people like that, this is not the church for you then. Um, you're not going to like it here because we do stuff. Um, and I just love that. So talk to lie. But point number one is you're going to have to take risks. Mm -hmm. Got to take risks. Number two is that we need to look at prioritizing community specific third spaces. And, and you were driving kind of towards that in, in some of the things that Capstone does. But um, so, you know, let's look at our buildings. It's, it's one of the largest parts of our budgets, either in mm -hmm. continuing to pay for it, that, you know, that mortgage or lease, or uh, keep it, keep the roof from falling in on us now and leaking and heated and cooled. Uh, it's a huge money thing. Um, yeah. And so, you know, we're still, we're, so we're talking about the way things have evolved in the church over decades and centuries. I mean, we used to have people there more often than we do now. I mean, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, probably other things throughout the week. Some of you are still doing that. Um, but how well but it's did, the same people, it's the same yeah. church people showing up three times. How well yeah. did that work out over the last year when in a grinding halt, it was like, okay, we're not in this building at all. Um, maybe for some of you, you and a handful of other people went in there once a week and you recorded something to be able to be broadcast. So um, what a really interesting year we've had, Scott, when all of a sudden the location that was so central to everything we did became absolutely unusable in many cases. And yeah. most, of our, most of our churches have survived. Some have not. Some won't make it this year. Well, we're not going to see the we're not going to see the full effects of this for another eighteen months, two years. I don't think. Yeah, um, all the churches that will be casualties of the pandemic have a sizable. They saved for retirement, AJ, and so, mm -hmm. um, but they're not changing, and so we we can attribute the deaths of thousands of churches to the pandemic for sure for the next couple of years. Yeah. Um, yeah. We were so leveraged I would say, okay. heavy into, into real estate. We were leveraged heavy into real estate that wasn't really being utilized to a great extent. Yeah, uh, right. So, so the point number two is prioritize community-specific third space. The reality is that your facility can either be an asset or a liability to your church. 
and not just financially, although certainly financially it, it can be an asset or a liability. Um, I, always on a balance sheet, it's going to be your building's going to be shown as an asset. Yeah. Um, so I'm not stupid, but um, in terms of functional reality, though, for a lot of churches, that that facility is a liability because because of leaking roofs and you know deferred maintenance that's been deferred way too long and all these things. Um, so, but the, the point is not that. The point is that if you want to make a difference in a post-Christian world, you've really got to rethink the point of your building. And to your point, AJ, one of the most depressing realities from the pandemic was seeing just how useless um, most church buildings are beyond the Sunday morning program. They're just they're just big buildings with no purpose. And that doesn't have to be the case. Mm -hmm. So I talk to churches on the regular and the, they'll often have a dream of, we dream of opening up a coffee shop in our space. And I, I mean, I love that coffee shop. It's great. But a better question to ask would be, what resource does your community need that no one else is adequately providing? Chances are, now maybe your community doesn't have a coffee shop, but if your community has a coffee shop, they don't need your church to build a coffee shop. And they're not going to go there because it's going to, you know what I'm saying? Like they're not going to break their routine, their normal coffee stop to go to your church to get coffee. They're going to go to the place they've always gone to get coffee. So if you want to think about third space um, and third space, if you're not familiar with the what that means, it's, You've got home and you've got work, and then there's a third space. It's a it's a place to, to congregate to be outside of sort of work and home. Uh, and the church used to be a third space. It was a community gathering spot. It was a place where meetings happened. It was a place where people connected. It's not that anymore for most people. So to, to create a community-specific third space would be to think about what is a need in our community, and then let's build that thing. This is what, this is the model that Patrick provided. He, mills were expensive and every community needed a mill. It made their life so much easier than grinding their own grain. If there was a mill that they could go to, to have their, their grain ground for them, milled for them, it, it made a huge difference, right? And so Patrick built a, a community resource what resource does your community need that isn't being adequately provided um, for uh, in some other way? It's probably not a coffee shop, although it might be. Could be. Um, it could be, but depending on where you live. Most places have a Starbucks or something. So what is it? Um, what resource or second question might be, what resource does your current facility enable you to provide? So some churches are listening to this, you're listening to this pastor and you're thinking, well, in order for me to do that, I'd have to do a, a capital campaign or spend a bunch of money and build a something. Not necessarily. Think about what are the needs of your community and what could you do with your facility as it is right now? I just want you to think about what could you do right now? Yeah, you might have to do some renovation, light renovation, but what what could you do right now capstone's a great example of this they they um they turned their sunday school their old sunday school space that was used by adult sunday school classes into a space that's used aj for uh an at that after school program hmm. um so now they've got 50 60 kids walking across the street from the elementary school every day um, and that's its own nonprofit, self-funded at this point. It's not costing the church money, but they're providing a service to the community. It's amazing. Um, and so they took old Sunday school classrooms because the building they have, AJ, was not was built in the 90s, which you would think would mean to be fairly modern. No, this church was built in the 90s, but it looks like it was built in the 70s. Um, and uh, they took so they took this old building and they retrofitted it and they're using it for that. What could you use your building to meet a need right now in your community. I bet you could do something. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this, this is a really interesting one based on geography because yeah, if mm -hmm. you're, if you're a very rural church, maybe there might be like a lot of things that you could do. 
If you're an yeah. inner city church, there might also be a lot of things you can do because you're like, well, yeah, I'm in the middle of, of uh, Atlanta. <laughs> Atlanta has everything the world could possibly want. But yeah, maybe not your neighborhood because, you know, the bigger right. the city, the, the more population density you have, the more, the smaller your radius becomes for where resources are needed. So, um, yeah. you know, the rural church and the urban church might have the same needs that, that they could meet. Um, that's such a good point, AJ. I, I, you know, I grew up in Dallas. I, I live in Tennessee now, but I, I grew up in the Metroplex and I was back home a, a few months ago, AJ, I was driving around kind of my old neck of the woods, um, with my family. And I, it dawned on me when I was there, just how small my world really was. Mm. And even though I lived in one of the largest cities in the world, uh, cause when I was young, especially we lived in, in Dallas proper and my world though, was really small. It was five miles, maybe three miles. Yeah. Almost every day. So even in a big city, to your point, AJ, and if you're in a place like Chicago or New York, your world is not three miles. It's it's maybe three blocks. Yeah. Um, and you, for the most part, you're you're not going uptown, downtown. You're you're going where you're where you live, and there are needs specific to your three blocks. Yeah or your three miles yeah. or your 30 miles. If you're in the country, um, a really good example of this, AJ, uh, North Webster church of God, going to give them a shout out. Um, they live in a small town, Nor um, North Webster, Indiana is not a, sm not a big place. I think that the population is a few hundred of the town itself. Um, they're a church of about 600 people. I, I remember, whatever they're averaging was more than what the population of the town was because uh, they're a regional church. They're pulling from the whole county, uh, maybe even a couple counties. But one of the things that I love that they did, AJ, is where they live, there's no there's no McDonald's or um, Chick-fil-A that has a play place, like a, a, an indoor space for kids to play. It just doesn't exist. And so they built, when they did build a facility because they needed one anyway, but when they built it, they built it, they focused on that open space that could be used throughout the week. And um, it, they put in a kids play area and they did put a coffee shop in, but the draw is not the coffee shop, although there isn't one of those in their town either. The, the real draw is the play place. They had envisioned actually when they built it, they told me, they thought that they'd have business people coming in and wanting to have meetings because of the coffee shop and they had put some nice little tables and chairs, but they realized really quickly that that wasn't happening because the play place was also there. So people didn't want to bring, go and do it like a business meeting because they could, the kids were so loud playing <laughs> it ended up becoming like the mommy hangout for this County. Um, mom's coming in tired of entertaining their kids at their house. So they let them play play dates that kind of thing happening there. And so the coffee shop's getting used, but it's mainly by moms staying ca caffeinated. This is an idea of, you know, if you live in a place that's got Chick-fil-A, you probably don't need a play place. You might not like, cause moms are already, trust me. I know when, when, when all of those Chick-fil-A's are open, it, they're filled with moms taking their kids to the play place. Um, and dad, moms and dads. I, I have also just taken my kids and said, here's some ice cream now go play <laughs> at the at the chick-fil-a um at any rate I, I just want you to think think about what is it that your community needs and how could you retrofit fit or build um something that reaches a need right now because mm -hmm. that that is one of the key ways um to reach post-christian world and it's a lesson from saint patrick Absolutely. So our first one was got to take risks. Now we're talking about creating a, some kind of a third space, something that your property or your building or even some other partnership you could do in your community could create, meet a need that, that your community needs. Number three is focus on reproducing your team. Oh my gosh, we have to drive leadership development so hard with the churches that we work with. And it's something that if that's been a point of innovation, even for us as an organization over the last couple of years to be able to yeah. meet this need that a lot of churches don't even think they need. Uh, but we're happy to introduce them to the fact that reproducing their team is going to be one of their greatest assets to 
to, um, you know, keep their church going generation after generation. And uh, St. Patrick was a good example of that uh, 1,500 years ago in creating a group around him that saw the vision and wanted to continue to perpetuate that. And, uh, mm -hmm. and the results, you know, are shown for us in history. And that's got to be the case in your church as well, that building yeah. into our next generation of leaders, building up our present team and our next generation who will, who will come up behind us is, is absolutely an imperative focus that we have to have. And I had this in a conversation yesterday. I just met with a couple of church leaders yesterday and, and, you know, that was part of the conversation was thinking about leadership development. That's what we were there to talk about. And, but it was, what, what is our, what's our outlook now for a few years, but what's our, even our further outlook on that? What are we going to be do, doing now to be building people up so that five, 10 years from now, even um, we're, we're better than we are today, you know? And, and I love that about, you know, this, this particular um, church that I was talking with is, I mean, they don't just want to keep things going. It wasn't a preservationist mindset on leadership development but it was an innovation and betterment and, you know, greater vision, greater capacity and greater results going forward. Um, and yeah. so whether St. Patrick knew he was doing that, you know, or if it was just like the way he operated, you know, like I need a team and, um, but the results uh, were the same either way. Um, he had people that wanted to continue the vision. And so we've got to be thinking in those, in those terms. Yeah, I'm going to say something that might sound surprising. He did have people, that's true, um, but he he had a system, um, and that it matters. It matters. It, you know, we think about systems thinking as a modern innovation, and it's just really not. I mean, we see this in Paul had a system. Um, you can kind of read into the details. You can, I mean, you can kind of sketch it out yourself, right? what Paul would do. He'd go, he'd go into a city. He would preach in the synagogues and then he would preach in the, in sort of the more open spaces that were where there would be some non Jewish folk there. He kind of had a system for, for doing that and then building people and then um, creating a church there and then do something crazy that would get him stoned or kicked out. Right. <laughs> uh, but he had a system for, for planting churches. It wasn't, it wasn't just like organic, like, oh, I think I'm going to hop in here and plant a church. No, he he had a strategy. And same was true with Patrick. He he had a team. Yes, he had people, but he had a system. He knew, OK, we're going to start the mill first and then we're going to build this second and we're going to approach the people this way. And this is what we're going to do. And then we're going to train these people and then we're going to put them on a boat and then we're going to send them down river. Um, and so you need a system. If everything right now in your church hinges around people, when those people are gone, you'll have no vision, you'll have no strategy. You need a system. And uh, again, something might be counterintuitive that you, I, I think some people maybe would say this is a bad thing. I don't think it's bad in, in every sense. McDonald's is a good example of this, AJ. <laughs> um, have you read the e-myth or the e-myth revisited? Uh, yeah. He talks about this, this idea that you need some franchisability mm. of what you do. Like the reason why McDonald's works is that anybody can own a McDonald's because when they start a McDonald's, you're not guessing anything. You're not guessing, well, what should the menu be? How should we do pricing? How should we train new employees? How should we cook the burgers? It's why you can walk into any McDonald's in this country and the burger's going to taste the same. Mm -hmm. The fries are going to taste the same. I mean, outliers, some are going to be cold or whatever, not good, but not good compared to what? Compared to what you're used to. You go, well, this is not McDonald's. These fries are cold or this burger didn't taste right. It, it only works because you, you know what McD McDonald's is supposed to be because they've created a consistent thing. Yeah. And I'm not trying to say your church needs to be McDonald's. Don't hear that. But there's a lesson to be learned there from Patrick, from McDonald's, that you need a system. You need a reliable way to reproduce yourself and reproduce your team so that when you're long gone, when, when you've gone home to be with the Lord or you've moved on to some other church, 
the mission and the vision of the church continues without you. Mm. That's that's success. Yeah, success isn't what you're able to do; it's what the people after you are able to do. Um, and that's tough in today's society, AJ, where we're so like a celebrity culture, and we even do this with minor Christian celebrities, right? We we elevate people. Um, and there's something to be said about stepping away from that a little bit and making sure we have a system. That's good. Uh, and McDonald's knew that people needed a third space where they could afford ribs. And so McRibs, they said, we're it's going, not, it may not be ribs. <laughs> we're bringing ribs to the masses. That's right. In limited supply for a limited time. <laughs> Thank you, McDonald's. Uh, uh, jokes aside, though, right? I mean, that's what Ray Kroc understood. Yeah. Ray Kroc, when he walked in, he, he realized very quickly, oh, these McDonald's guys. I mean, watch that watch that movie, the, the Ray Kroc movie. Yeah, what, The you, Founder, I think the it's founder, called. Yeah. He saw it. He goes, ah, uh, they're not selling burgers. They're selling a way to make burgers. You'll likely not be a Ray Kroc fan at the end of it, but you'll keep stuffing fries in your mouth. I guarantee it. So I don't know. I, again, p- people are imperfect, right? There's there's things to learn from people, even that even imperfect ones, especially more on the more ones. on the business side of things than the personal side of things sure. <laughs> in, in the Ray Kroc story. Yeah. But we yeah. certainly digress at this point. Um, okay. So our let's recap. So um, you know we're talking about innovative evangelism, and St. Patrick was a really good example of that. You got to take risks. He stepped out in faith. Um, and did something that had not been seen since um, the decades after Christ uh, left us in person. In the face of a lot of vocal opposition, too. People said it no, wasn't possible. No. They weren't willing to support it. Yep. Uh, he, he, was he wasn't like, waiting for consensus. I just, I'm sorry. I just really <laughs> want to hit this point. Like, so many times, I've worked with churches all the time. They're like, we weren't unanimous on this. Yeah. Who cares? If it's right, you don't need unanimous if it's right you, we, among an entire congregation let me preface that not maybe not unanimous i mean a small group of leaders might be unanimous and here's a need are 100 of our congregation's not on board i'm sorry i'm like yeah. even if, you, if you've got eight leaders and 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 four only four of them are there or five of them are there and three of them aren't that's good enough for me <laughs> move on if you know it's right yeah that's right yeah sorry. I'm, step out i'm bold okay. on that it's all right i'm bold uh, on that Create, prioritize community specific third space. What can you do? Look, open your eyes to opportunities in front of you. Um, meeting needs, getting people together, um, being there for a purpose. And of course, you've got a higher purpose. There's there's an upper story happening to what your church is after. Um, but what can we do to meet people where they are and, and make a difference in their lives today? And then number three, focus on reproducing your team. This is this is not supposed to be, you know, the the pastor show. Um, build up people around you, and um, and that was another, you know, a good point that that you had and that we didn't really touch into on this, Scott. But but having something that's not person specific but vision specific, and so that it it can continue on in perpetuity after you, as awesome and dynamic of a of a preacher and a leader that you might be, the world is gonna have to go on after you're gone, have people around you that are ready to continue the work. Um, yeah. And, well, and I want to emphasize, sure. I intentionally phrase this, focus on re- reproducing your team and not just reproducing yourself. Yeah. Because if you reproduce yourself, you're just, you've just re- reproduced another person for, for everyone to rally around, right? You want to have a team around you and you want everyone on that team to reproduce themselves, right? It, it, it's, Reproduce the whole team, not just yourself. You want a system that reproduces leaders down, leaders all the way down, as they, turtles all the way down, as they say. So take it to heart. I hope this is really challenging you this week. And don't forget to be back with us next week because we're going to get into kind of a specific example of, of somebody really taking on a lot of these attributes and ideas and bringing them out into the real world. So, um, yeah, let's, let's try to challenge ourselves to be a little bit more like good old St. Pat and, uh, and really look at the world through a new lens and through a new vision of what can be accomplished. Uh, and I love, we do this with, we talk about this with churches all the time, 
we don't bring necessarily new things. I mean, we, we get back to what did we see in God's word? What did we see the early church doing? And that's kind of what St. Patrick had, had, you know, an, an awakening of, of um, sorts to what was, what was happening 500 years before me. Now we can say what was happening 1500 years before us. There's the book again, the by, uh, hold it still. Celtic, so read way, it. Of Celtic way of evangelism. Way of evangelism by George Hunter. G Hunter the the third. How hey. Christian can reach the West again. Yeah. It's again. fantastic. Again. Again. Well, there, yeah, there you go. He was making my point. Um, we've done it before in various parts of the world and it can happen again. And we've got to be thinking that way in 2021 and beyond because the world needs us to re-innovate. Hey, thanks for being with us. This has been episode 81 of the Church Revitalization Podcast, and you can read uh, what we were talking about today in a little bit more detail at malfersgroup.com slash 81. Thanks, Scott. This is a great topic again this week. Yeah, so good. And thanks so much for uh, for tuning in. Celebrate St. Patrick's Day. You know, eat, wear some green eat something, eat some lucky, lucky charms, F find you a four leaf clover. Uh, if you're, if you're not Baptist, drink a green beer. Um, or I guess there are certain kinds of Baptists. You're probably up for that. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, but, I'm uh, not taking that any further <laughs> than where you've laid it. Thanks for being with us, everybody. We'll be back with you again next week. <laughs> See ya.